Grace to you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, today we continue in the Lenten season and we join with Jesus as he prepares, as he moves closer and closer to Jerusalem for Holy Week. We follow in his footsteps. And our readings touch on a theme that spans the Old Testament text today, our epistle reading from James and our gospel reading out of Mark. It's a theme that you and I and every man, woman, and child will face in life. It's, of course, this topic of temptation. I want you to think on this for a moment. How often or how do we portray temptation in the world? Temptation is this universal experience, and because of that, I think we have a lot of different ways of talking about temptation. You know, there's that classic Looney Tunes cartoon where the devil was sitting on one shoulder and an angel on the other. And they argue. They bicker back and forth in the person's ear. Tempted for evil and encouraged for good. Temptation being this great battle between good and evil right next to our ears. Sometimes we use this idea of temptation as an adjective to describe something. That in the thing itself is temptation. We might have a tempting offer that's too good to be true. A tempting meal that calls to us when we know we probably shouldn't. That something valuable sitting right there out in the open is rather tempting. The temptation comes to us on behalf of the thing. Well, sometimes we bring God into the mix of temptations as well and have him be a part of our rationalization of the temptation that's before us. Have you ever caught yourself thinking something along these lines? Well, if God didn't want me to have it, he wouldn't put it right there. Or if God didn't want me to, he wouldn't have brought me right to it. Or worse yet, we can trivialize temptation by saying, well, maybe God won't mind this one time. Well, do you notice this common theme in the way that temptation is portrayed? It's always external. It's someone else's fault. It passes the buck from you and me on to something that's not us. And there's something comforting in that. That it's not us, that it's this world that's trying to gather us up, trying to get us to do something. It's someone else, it's someone out there that has nothing to do with you and I. And when we think this way, temptation is a product of life in a sinful and fallen world. It's just something that happens to us. And there is some truth to that. There is temptation out in the world. It certainly doesn't come from God. But compare that with how our epistle text for today talks about temptation. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. For James, his concern with temptation is not the out there-ness of it, but rather the much more uncomfortable and unsavory right here of it all. His concern is our desires, our very inward being that is so easily led astray. There might be something comforting about temptation out there, but when we consider it in here, a twisting of our desires, it turns poor, innocent us into right into the thick of it, right in the midst of sin. We can't pin or shift the blame because the issue starts here. So where does it begin with us? It starts with our desires, our want of things, our want of emotions or experiences. And at face value, nothing wrong with that. The temptation arises from wanting something in a sinful way. James reminds us at the end of our reading, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. 
God is the source of all good things. And temptation calls us to look for these good things outside of his will for us. To gain them in dishonorable or sinful ways. This desire leads to sin, James tells us. Our desires latch on to something, cling to it, and we seek to gain it no matter the cost. We transgress God's will with our sin, and sin twists us, contorts us, and ultimately leads to death. The death of something good, the death of a relationship, spiritual death, and ultimately eternal death. Sin worms its way through our desires, and it's the ugly truth of temptation. But it starts here. Think for a moment about the temptations that plague you. Maybe it's something we desire, something that's from our neighbor, some aspect of his or her life that we don't have, whether it be a spouse or money or car or a station in life or even the comfort they so seemingly enjoy. And instead of turning to God and asking for these good gifts, our desires lead us to hate him, to murder him in our hearts. And this sin leads to death in that relationship. Our desire can grab hold of our bank account and want us to expand it no matter the cost. And instead of seeking God's peace, we seek to gain in sinful and dishonorable ways. We take shortcuts. We offer less than honest tax returns. We turn everything in our favor for the sake of money. And it brings death. Greed, wanting to gain in a sinful way, destroys our relationship with the world. As we see it as a way to bring something new, to gather it, to elevate ourselves above others. It happens when we desire intimacy. When we desire that connection with another, and in our temptations, we seek that good gift outside of God's will. We turn to pornography, adultery. It brings death in our marriages, or in the chastity that God has called his people to. These things, as innocent as they seem in the beginning, are twisted in our sins, and it leads to death. It's harmful for our souls. It destroys this relationship that we have with the world. It destroys our trust in the God who brings those good gifts. And it ultimately leads to death because of sin. Think on it for a few moments. Your life, as you sit in the pew this morning, what temptations are you wrestling with? What desire is turning towards sin in your life? And what sin is bringing death? As we look at our gospel reading this morning, we see a similar story play out, but with a completely different ending. Mark tells us in the fewest amount of words possible, the Spirit immediately drove him, him being Jesus, out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. Jesus had just finished being baptized, and the first thing the Spirit does is drive him to the wilderness, drive him to the place where his ancestors, those who wandered in the wilderness, fell into their temptations, fell short of God's will for them, fell into sin and death. Now Jesus goes to that same place, and there he meets that old foe, Satan. And in our other Gospels, we learn quickly what Satan offers to Jesus. He does what he would offer you and I, something according to his desires. Bread to feed his hunger. Power as he shows himself falling from the temple top or maybe the world if he just fell down and worshipped Satan. Drawing those desires. Looking for that inroad. But our Lord is resolute. He refuses And every time Satan comes at him with some twisted desire, he reminds him exactly who is in charge, where those good gifts come from, as he turns to God through the scriptures. It's this beautiful back and forth where Satan tries as he might, but our Lord stands resolute. But Satan doesn't leave 
Jesus alone following that 40 days. Satan hounds Jesus his entire ministry. And every step of the way, Satan is defeated. He and his minions are cast out. He's turned down at every turn. And at the end of our Lenten journey, we gather before the cross. This place where Jesus is going these days as we follow him to the very place where temptation, where sin, where death is dealt with. And in that moment, it appears as though Satan has finally won. He has destroyed the God of life. Jesus, the sinless one, the resolute one upon the cross, takes upon himself our twisted desires. He takes upon himself our sinful actions. And he takes upon himself death. The Lord of life takes on the death that you and I have so rightly earned through our sin. All of this is placed on his shoulders as he dies. Yet all of this could not hold him. He rises from the dead. He stands in victory over everything that brings death to you and I. Christ emerges alive. And he gives this gift to his children, a new heart, life itself. He draws them up from the grave and brings them with him in life. That is the good news of this morning, that in Jesus, in his death and resurrection, we find the answer to our temptations, to our sins, to our struggles with death, because it's in Jesus that we have forgiveness, that when that sinfulness comes out of us, when we latch on to those desires in wrong ways, our Lord brings forgiveness. Daily, he gives to us a new heart in that battle with temptation that we face. And our Lord gives to you and I a sympathetic ear. It is Jesus who resisted Satan in the wilderness. It is Jesus who defeated Satan every step of the way. And it is Jesus that cast him down. So in our struggles, as we wrestle with sin, with temptation, with evil, as we try as we might to resist, we have a God who has beaten it all who in prayer is close by in times of temptation. And that when we wrestle with the sinful desires of our heart, is there to give us that new heart, to restore us, to forgive us. And when we ultimately fall in our temptations, as each and every one of us will, when we find ourselves back in that guilt and shameful spot of doing those sins that we wrestled with, we find a Savior who died and rose for us, who welcomes us into his house, who cleanses us with his word, who feeds us with his very body and soul and reminds you that you are a beloved child of God. The joy of gathering together here as a congregation is that all of us, each and every one of us, wrestle with this. All of us struggle with temptation. All of us fall to temptation. But it's here that Jesus takes the sinful, broken people we are and makes them new, breathes life into you and to me, and is with us as we continue that struggle until the day we see him coming again on the clouds in glory, where all things will be made new. And until that great and glorious day, as we wrestle with Satan and our own sinful desires, we walk with our Lord, who has defeated it all, and offers us his sympathetic ear. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.